Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Insights, Newcastle University's public lecture programme. Uh, my name is Martin Farr. I'm co-chair of the Public Lectures Committee and also a senior lecturer in contemporary British history here at Newcastle University. And I'll be chairing this evening's event and contributing some perspectives from the British responses to the invasion of Ukraine and preparing for this evening's event, going through a timeline of what's taken place since 2014 and the annexation of Crimea. Um, it's striking how familiar the sequence of events and the tectonic plates shifting uh, feel when reading about the years before the First World War, before the Second World War, um, the, enormous, um, the, the enormity of the experience which we've um, lived through, and of course the Ukrainian people have lived through since February 2022, when in Vladimir Putin's words, he launched a special military operation, quote, to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, since which, and numbers are, are rather uh, imprecise, uh, 9,000 civilians have died at least, 15,000 have been injured. Um, these are even less precise, but we estimate Russia has lost 40,000 uh, soldiers dead, uh, 100,000 wounded, Ukraine 18,000, and 110 wounded, um, not to mention the millions of refugees. Um, and Newcastle has, ever since the invasion, has um, held events to try and understand what's taken place. Uh, we had a symposium in history shortly after the invasion where speakers um, tried to make sense of the situation for members of the public. Uh, we had a public lecture um, from my colleague Rob Dale earlier this year, which many of you attended. Uh, and we have this evening's event, which we hope will again provide insight and personal experience that only someone from um, Ukraine can offer. Um, and so at this point, I will introduce our, our panelists. Uh, first on my left is Tatyana Dunyova, who is uh, a bilingual Ukrainian and Russian speaker uh, from the Poltava National University in Ukraine. Uh, she has uh, written and researched books on fiction, essays, articles on language and literature, has a PhD in linguistics, and in June 2022, came to the UK as part of the Homes for Ukraine scheme with her 11-year-old son. Uh, and has been living in York ever since, uh, and has, is a member of a grant in York um, to research um, the war, a two-year grant. Ian Garner uh, is historian and analyst of Russian culture and war propaganda, took his PhD at the University of Toronto in 2017 uh, after studying at the St. Petersburg State Conservatory in Russia. Um, his motivations in his first book on Stalingrad, uh, and his new book, Z, Z Generation, Into the Heart of Russia's Fascist Youth, is with Russia's obsession with war and what has driven so many Russians uh, to fall for militarism. You are also, Ian, we were discussing earlier, on the Russian sanctions list. Uh, could you tell, tell us what that is and what the consequences are? Uh, it means I'm not allowed to go to Russia anymore. But beyond that, there doesn't really seem to be much impact on me as far as I know. But we may, we may find out in Actually, due course yes. that that's not true. We are being recorded, I should also mention that as well. Um, the, the lecture will be available as all of our lectures are on the Insights Archive, which you can go back several years on the webpage. Um, Stella Gervas is uh, my colleague, uh, not for much longer, because she's been appointed to a very prestigious uh, chair at UCLA. Uh, but she's a historian of the intellectual and international history of modern Europe, with special reference to peacemaking and to Russian history. She has lived in Russia, Ukraine, as well as the UK and the US, uh, is a fellow of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and her new book, Conquering Peace, has just won the Laura Shannon Prize for the best book in contemporary European studies. <laughs> Um, and I should also mention, in case I forget, uh, we have flyers for discounts for both Ian and Stella's books on the table outside after the lecture. Right, could I turn to the panel and ask, as, as we've arranged, for a five minutes of, of overview uh, of the subject before we go into questions and comments. Please, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, thank you very much for coming here. I did have some time to prepare, and uh, I was thinking about the opening words, what I'd like to say first. And it was very difficult to find those words, because this is the war in my country. This is the war which started in uh, 2014, the war started by Russia. And uh, there have been other wars. Yeah, there was World War I, very difficult, a terrible disaster for Europe, World War II. There were people trying to reflect on that, somehow think what happened, and yet those words, those reflections, now they seem both helpful and not very helpful. 
So what I'd like to say uh, a couple of the stories, um, I'd like to tell a couple of the stories to you. I'm not able to relay them as a single story, you know, as a single narrative, as very logical connections. Uh, I will relate the stories with the ep uh, epigraph taken from Ernest Hemingway famous book, Farewell to Arms, when he quoted John Donne and said that no person is an island. Uh, every person is a continent. That's why if anybody dies, a part of us dies as well. So this war. I come from Poltava, which is a city in uh, central eastern Ukraine, which is between Kyiv, the capital, and Kharkiv. Now many people know Kharkiv. And uh, when the war started in 2014, it still seemed quite far away, even though it was terrible and shocking. And uh, Poltava was still quite a safe place to live. The war started coming close very soon, though. Uh, a graduate from my university, a graduate from the Department of History, was killed in the Elbaz region. A memorial plaque to him appeared on the walls of my university. Every day on my way to my lecture room, I passed by that memorial plaque. There were always fresh flowers. Then I met a new colleague. Uh, she joined our department of Ukrainian literature. She came from Luhansk. She had to flee from that city with her family, with her husband and daughter. And she said the only thing she missed very, very much was her library, which she had to leave behind. Yet. It was still kind of slow. And then the war rushed in. Then there was the 24th of February, 2022. Early in the morning, my sister, who lived close to Kyiv, messaged me, I can hear shooting. It is real. It is not on TV. 40 minutes later, I heard the sirens. The same sirens I heard many times in the films about the Second World War. They were not in the films. They were real. Then, there were desperate tears of my son. He was nine at the time. Uh, who He asked me why I was not helping him to get ready for his school, and I told him the war. Then, there were a few nights of very, very difficult decision what to do when I heard the air uh, raid alert at night, and we didn't have any proper shelter to go, you know, Nobody really was preparing for any sort of the war. And we lived in a block of flat, so the only thing which I could do for a sort of safety is to get him into the bathroom, which didn't have the windows and was inside the flat. But it was the middle of the night and he was sleeping fast. So it was a really, really tough choice whether to take at least this measure of precaution or just let him sleep peacefully one another night. And then there were difficult decisions what to take while packing. I was trying to pack four small backpacks, one with the documents, uh, two with the warm things for my son. It was very cold in March of that year in Ukraine, and one backpack for me. I packed water into every backpack because I knew maybe I wouldn't be able to take all of them. My hope was to take at least one with the documents because I knew very well people, when they were living in Kharkiv, they, were, they had to leave bags on the train station. They could not get inside of the evacuation train. And um, then we met uh, new friends. Then we were safe in uh, Hungary. And we met new friends, a very, very nice family from Kyiv, a mother and two children, and daughter and a son. And the mother had very nice, fancy skirt, and she didn't have the jeans. And the reason for that was that when her family, her son and her husband, were packing things for her because there were so loud shootings, and she was very much afraid to leave the basement. So her husband and son were packing the things. And they took the fancy skirt, which she was wearing in another life, in that peaceful life. And um, other things were happening as well, the things which are beyond comprehension, very difficult to explain. On the 3rd of March 2022, one uh, colleague of mine, a painter and a very respectful teacher, associate <coughs> professor of my university, was killed defending Ukraine from the invasion. 
Uh, I could also recognize myself in some of the photos which were taken, the photos of the people I never knew. One of the photos, maybe you also saw these photos because it became kind of famous. That is a photo of a young girl from Ukraine. She's about three years old. And uh, there is her name and uh, Sorry, the parents' address, uh, the parents' contacts written at the back of, of, uh, of the girl with a ball, ball pen. And when I saw that photo, I just saw the photo, I could not read the story, but I immediately understood what the mother was trying to do. It was similar to something I was trying to do. Because uh, when we were boarding that vacation train, I was trying to tell my son that if we get lost, <laughs> Sorry. He could um, he could try to find me through my university. Uh, he knew my phone number by uh, by heart, but I was not sure he would remember it, and um, I was not sure that uh, the piece of paper would not be lost. So I was trying to tell him that he could try to find me via the Facebook or my university. They would always be able to reach me. And um, that was, that, that, as you can imagine, that was not helpful very, ma uh, very much because it did not calm his down. Yeah, but when I saw that photo, I did not read to, need to read the story. I understood that mother very, very much. She was trying to do the same, uh, trying to keep in touch with her little child. So uh, there is no end now. Yeah, I just stop abruptly, abruptly because there are much more stories which I can tell, and there are just so much stories of pain, suffering, hope, and I would like to emphasize a lot of help, a lot of help that Ukrainians give to each other, and a lot of help that we Ukrainians get from other people, just ordinary people in many countries, and this is something which really supports us. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, please. So firstly, thank you all for coming and thank you for organizing this and inviting me, but mostly thank you to Titiana for sharing that very difficult and very personal story. But I want to share a bit about what things are like inside Russia right now, because you probably all know the media that you read, the broadsheet newspapers, the tabloid newspapers, media networks all over the West are obsessed with opinion polls, are obsessed with figuring out how many Russians really support the war, what's going on. And then we, we see the lurid stories of, you know, when, when's the revolution happening? When's the palace coup happening? Is Yevgeny Prigozhin, this slightly monstrous Wagner leader, going to... Take his, take his boys from Wagner and storm the Kremlin and kick Putin out. Is Putin himself sick? When will the public opinion break in Russia against the war? And depressingly, I suspect the public opinion will not break against the war. Not this year, not this month, and not anytime soon. What we've seen over the last how long has it been, 15 months now, is very little movement in opinion of polls. And in the work that I've been doing, talking to young Russians, figuring out what are the ways in which they're talking about the war? What are the ways in which they're talking about their lives? And in particular, how are they talking about their relationship to the state and to the state's myths of war? We see that increasingly young people in particular may not be the hope that we're looking for. There is a bit of an assumption that young people inevitably everywhere are just going to move towards a more kind of liberal, global perspective on life, in particular because of the internet. I just don't see it happening. We see Prigozhin as a monster, for example. You might have seen that video of him that came out, was it last week, at the front line, ranting and raving, attacking Putin. And he's asking for trouble from Putin, certainly. But when you look at Russian social media networks, the videos of Prigozhin that are going viral, a Prigozhin at the front, standing in front of maps, pointing where are the troops going to go? Here's the ways we're supporting the troops. It's a different world. And the state is, in increasingly sophisticated ways, using its control over not just traditional media, but digital media which is where all of us live our lives today, even if you are not a social media user. 
the news you see and the reality you see is being distorted by what other people are producing and reading on social media. The state understands this, the state is responding to it, and the state is finding ways to adapt. And the state currently is embarking on a mass ideologization program for young Russians. Whether they can be successful or not in the long term is another question. But what they are trying to do is instill in young Russians a relationship to the state in which it is impossible to be a young Russian today and participate in society, to join a community group, to join a youth group, without engaging with the state and without engaging with the state's narratives of war. The most important narrative is a narrative of sacrifice and martyrdom. That is a narrative that goes back many centuries. But in particular, it relates to the myth of World War II and the story of World War II that is taught to Russians is not our story that is encapsulated in this little phrase, never again. We respect the sacrifices that the soldiers made during World War II, but boy, we wish that they didn't have to make those sacrifices, right? The phrase is, Mojim povtarit. We can do it again. It had to happen. We had to sacrifice our soldiers to save the world in World War II, to save humanity, to save Russia. Just as we have to go through a period of sacrifice again today to somehow rejuvenate ourselves. And our hopes are in the young generation. And if you think that the young are just turning away from the state's myths of war, its ideas of war, you need only look at the youth army the Youth Army is a paramilitary youth group founded by the state in 2016. It's Cub Scouts with guns. They teach some pretty scary stuff. They use social media influences, hashtags, digital games, memes, virality to draw kids into this world. And I can tell you some stories through the rest of the evening. It makes it look appealing. And their membership has leapt over the last year from a million to 1.3 million. The state is putting millions more dollars this year than it was last year into this program. And when I spoke to, for research for my Z Generation book, some of the leaders of the Youth Army, they told me they couldn't keep up with demand. They don't have the places, they don't have the equipment, because so many young people actually want to join this. When you look beyond Moscow and St. Petersburg, where there are more liberal, more metropolitan kinds of kids growing up in more liberal metropolitan kinds of families. In the provinces, Russians are still looking to the war, still looking to military and thinking, this is right for us. And as they perhaps begin to re regret the death toll in Ukraine, they may regret this war, but will they reject the idea of a broader war, a war against the so-called collective West? I'm dubious and I fear for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for your very generous introduction. And my thanks go also to the Insights Public Lectures team for um, having organized this very timely uh, discussion. Uh, before uh, uh, giving you some thoughts, sharing with you, you some thoughts and some reflections on uh, um, the war in um, Europe we have today. Oh, thank you. I should mention two caveats. Uh, the first is that I am a historian of peace and peacemaking in Europe. So it can seem a little incongruous that I am part of this discussion, a historian of peace is a part of a discussion uh, on war. Um, but perhaps like I will show that it's very important to understand that um, uh, peace and war are both part of the same reality, of the same continuum of things. So, um, and one of the questions as a historian of peace, uh, I am, um, um, I am asking myself, it's how um, can we still talk about peace or peacemaking in uh, times of war? Uh, 
and how should we talk about peace in uh, a time of war. So, uh, and my second caveat, it's related to the perspective I have as a historian. Uh, I, uh, I study the long-term history of Europe. A historian usually needs a perspective uh, in time. And uh, my uh, rule of thumb, it's at least 20 years. But I will still share a few observations of this uh, on um, the war, on the Russo-Ukrainian war um, one year on. Uh, the first point I would like to mention, it's about the nature of this war. Uh, the nature of this war. It is as clear, it's a lot of debate, it's still debate around, but it's a clear that it's a war of aggression. It's a war of aggression with the purpose of um, invading, occupying, and uh, of annexing another country, Ukraine, which is a sovereign state, an independent state. Um, so on the Russian side uh, is that we can see that it's an imperial war, so that it's, uh, as Ukrainian um, historian Serhii Plohi uh, called it, it's, uh, it's definitely it's, uh, clear that it's a war, an imperial war, so Russia has, uh, the Russian Federation has an uh, imperial project to go back to the former borders of not just the Soviet Union, but of the Russian um, Tsarist Empire. Uh, but on the Ukrainian side, um, so that's, I would like to cite the Article 51 of the United Nations uh, Charter, which says that e if a state is uh, uh, attacked militarily, it has the inherent right of self-defense. So on the Ukrainian side, just I want to clarify that is definitely what we call a just war. Uh, and this uh, debate about the nature of this war, it's still going on. And precisely, it's not just a war on the battlefield. It's a war of words, of denominations. It's a war of propaganda. That's why the names um, matter, do matter very much in, in this war. So it's uh, this debate of how we should call this war. It's still, it's going on. So it's, uh, should you call it a Russian war, a Ukrainian war? Should you call it a Russian-Ukrainian war? Or um, Ukrainian war of independence? Uh, recently, I participated in another panel, and there are still historians, European historians, who call it a civilian war, a civil war. So that it's uh, also it's uh, kind of very debatable. And uh, I would suggest to call as um, um, uh, it in, in a very more simple and factual way a Russo or Russo-Ukrainian war. And uh, that is precisely the title of the new book of Serhii Plohi, which was uh, released today. So the precisely so, even this debate on the names. The names do matter. So the words do matter in this war. And that it's a war of uh, names, words, a war of ideas. And one of the ideas is precisely this idea of the concept of the West, which appear to uh, the president of the Russian Federation as uh, a main, one of the main uh, enemy of the, uh, his uh, state and his nation today. So my second point, it's related to the narratives. Uh, the narrative of war versus peace today. So it seems to me that it's a semantic jumble today um, in the words, when we talk about war versus peace, situations of war are described in terms of peace, like uh, um, Mr. Putin is sending, is bombing civilians, and he's calling it a, a situation of action, an operation of peacemaking. Uh, 
Miratvorchestva in Russian. So, and that situation of, uh, uh, of peace are described in terms of war. So should I just recall the debate when we have around the pandemic and COVID, how, how many uh, political uh, uh, rulers called the COVID as a situation, a state of war. So going against the pandemic. So it's a very important to understand that um, the state of peace and a state of war, they are part their degrees, it's not just black and white. They are part of the same continuum of things. And I try to make a clear distinction here between what you call the peacemaking and pacifism as nonviolence. They are two different things. As a historian of the long term of history of Europe, I can show you with evidence that the, what we call the non-violence or the war was never a categorical principle which would be never ruled out. And many, uh, and many of the philosophers and thinkers, of, for example, the 18th century, the so-called uh, authors of the plans of perpetual peace, right? So that it's a famous literary genre about the perpetual peace, what we will call today lasting peace. They never uh, put, for example, the war, they never ruled out of war. So the war was accepted as a possible tool in, uh, uh, in, uh, was, a, was an instrument in order to solve um, uh, discordances or conflicts or situation of conflicts in Europe. Uh, and that precisely, it's very important to understand, and that is my point, that Ukraine is not just fighting a just war. Uh, Ukraine it's fighting for a just peace. It's a very important thing because as you see in the media, this, um, this narrative on peace and peacemaking was very much monopolized on the Russian side. We continue, the uh, politicians continue to tell us that uh, uh, the Russian uh, government, it's open to negotiations, so-called peace negotiations, to, to return to a negotiating table. Um, the fact is that uh, in the last, uh, last year, in 2022, in early April, late March, early April, these uh, negotiations, peace negotiation between Russia and Ukraine stopped at the summit of Istanbul. And precisely we are trying to say that the <coughs> word of peace took even a negative connotation today. So basically by saying if you are talking about peace, if you are for peace, if you are writing a peace plan, because you have so many also these peace plans which appear going from Kissinger, the US uh, statement, uh, to um, uh, the Brazilian president Lula, and yesterday Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, the famous author of the end of history, talking about the, the end of the Cold War and uh, of the Soviet Union. So he also came yesterday with the new peace plans, which are very much criticized. And uh, uh, because precisely that it's a discussion, it should be, it's about the conditions of peace. It's not uh, about a peace plan per se. So, um, President Zelensky mentions the so-called peace formula, the Ukrainian peace formula, which comes first um, uh, through um, by winning this war. So that will be the first step. The conditions of peace are very different in the discussion. It's not about the peace per se, which should be one of the aims of the war, a state of peace. We should reach at certain point what it's does it mean to, uh, to fight for, uh, in a war and not having the same of bringing and um, 
going to peace, establishing peace one day. But precisely the point it's about, uh, my um, point is here that it's important to correct this narrative, it seems to me. Uh, uh, it's not um, uh, only Russians, the so-called peacemakers, with the mission of peacemakers, that they are trying to show their opening. It's not about that. It's about understanding that peace and what is the current war on the Ukrainian side, it's a, a fight for a just peace. It's not just uh, fighting a just war. So I will stop here, but we'll definitely have the opportunity to, to discuss further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. Um, yes. And I'll add a few comments and insights about um, the British response to this, um, because we are, after all, here. Um, and yesterday, uh, President Zelensky was here uh, embracing my friend Rishi as he embraced my friend Boris. Um, UK has, um, with whichever consequences you can, uh, can, can, can construe from that, um, but the Prime Minister changes, but the policy continues. Um, and I think were the government to change, the policy would continue. If there were a Labour government tomorrow, there'd be no difference in policy. Um, it's remarkable how much political consensus there's been on this subject since the invasion, um, and how keen the UK has been to have a prominent role in the response to the Russian invasion. Uh, it's second only to the United States in terms of military assistance. The Americans have offered about $29 billion worth of aid, and we are approaching five billion pounds worth of military assistance to the Ukrainian people. Um, this began, in a sense, capability building began after Ukrainian independence in 1991 and was accelerated after the annexation of Crimea in 2014, where Operation Orbital was introduced to um, the British Army to train the Ukrainian Army. And 21,000 Ukrainian troops had been trained by the time that Orbital was replaced by Operation Interflex, uh, which, is, which is currently in place after the invasion, which trains Ukrainian troops in the UK. So Zelensky has been here twice, and he both, on both occasions went out to Salisbury to meet Ukrainian troops who are being uh, trained by the British Army. Um, and so this was a remarkable um, situation. It's provided, um, um, whatever else it is, it's provided an opportunity for um, UK global uh, role after Brexit. Um, it's, it's been part of the a reconnection with the EU and with France and Germany in particular um, and the damage that the Brexit had caused. Um, and it does challenge British foreign policy in the sense that before the invasion, um, we were trying, as we often do, to accommodate the American Pacific tilt. Um, and it's quite a challenge now we've been dragged back into the European sphere, which some would say we should never have left, um, that the integrated review for British foreign policy's blueprint has shifted from uh, Russia being a major threat to China being a major threat. And of course, China is one of the long-term beneficiaries of the war, arguably, um, and is one of the ways in which Russia is uh, avoiding sanctions by selling uh, cheap um, fuel to China and to India. And one of the interesting dimensions of the war, which we may come to, is the way in which the, 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 the global divisions are not as clear as, as what would once have been thought. Um, there's been more um, agency to non-aligned powers, such as India, um, China, uh, South Africa, who can see the opportunity of the war for leverage. There can be a European-centric view of the war in thinking of this as being of universal importance when the, the view in many parts of the world is that this is a European conflict. Um, and it's often cited that um, it ill behoves uh, the West and the UK and the US in particular to be citing territorial integrity um, with the legacy and the scarring of the war in Iraq, uh, among other interventions. Um, and in terms of public opinion, um, very striking. I mean, there's very little parliamentary dissent. Uh, there is, perhaps on the extra parliamentary left, uh, Stop the War Coalition, for example, would not necessarily, I mean, they are publicly co condemning of the Russian invasion, but would, would cite NATO as a, as a provoking or as, as a provocation for the invasion, Western policy more broadly as being a provocation, uh, and will call for peace talks um, rather, than, uh, rather than victory, which is the, the view of the British government, although what victory constitutes we'll come on to in a moment. Um, and the last point would really be extending the political consensus from Parliament into the public. Uh, at the last polling I saw, which is in February, 81% uh, of the UK population who have been polled want Ukraine to win. Um, and of course, what, what does to win mean? How far does that does that extend to Crimea or merely to the territory which has been taken since February 2022? 76% uh, of the population care, quote, a great amount or, quote, a fair amount about the war. 
Um, so an, an unusual level of um, salience for a foreign policy um, issue for the public, one in which Britain is, is fighting by proxy, but we do, as we know from the uh, CIA leaks uh, last month, have uh, at least 50 special forces uh, members in Ukraine, more than twice as many as any other country. 43% uh, of the population wish to maintain the current level of UK support for Ukraine, and 23% would like to increase that support. So there's still consensus at the moment. And this comes after the weaponizing of winter and the consequences of inflation, which the war has stoked, um, and the, the, the potential for public support for the war to diminish. Um, we've got questions from, um, pre prepared questions, presenting questions from um, members of the public, as well as questions from the floor. So before I come and open, the lights come on and I ask questions from the floor, I have a question from Matt Taylor, which I think ties neatly my comments with those of the panel. Um, and Matt Taylor asks, um, is the rest of the world doing enough? Who would like to respond to that? Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, for the question, maybe while answering it, I'll go briefly to the very first days of the large-scale Russia's invasion uh, to Ukraine, which is February 2022. Yeah, and um, when we in Ukraine were watching this news, when we were learning about what's happening in other cities and towns from our friends and relatives, yeah, the really Ukraine wished so, so much for the air defense systems, yeah, just to protect the civilians from the air raid attacks. And I remember there was such a desperate hope that just probably within the days, the help would come and days were passing and passing and passing and passing. So now, of course, Ukraine has got a tremendous help from many countries, the UK including, but you know, every day when the Russian missile hits a block of flats with people, with just ordinary civilians, yeah, and uh, when, in a way, you can, you can always relate to this to these people, because either their stories resemble yours, or you just, you really happen to know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody for whom this person matters a lot. So every day when it happens, yeah, definitely there is much more which is needed to protect the civilians and to push Russia back. So if I may just add uh, um, one related question of what we can do we here, so what we can, in which way, that it's a question I ask myself on the um, um, wars resumed in February of the last year, because uh, we should say that this war started with the invasion of Crimea in February 2014, so almost 10 years ago. And um, um, among my friends, among colleagues, um, some of them, Want to the battlefield, our part. Uh, want to, you know, colleagues, as I had a friend, a very dear friend, uh, who is a philosopher at the Academy of Sciences in Kiev. He decided for him was a real mission to defend uh, his country. So, and um, he went to the war and um, he died. And other people are trying to help with uh, very different charity and philanthropic actions to support the war. But I was asking myself as a historian, as a historian, what I can do with this war? Uh, what I can do except that to think uh, and to explain what is happening right now. Uh, and I believe that wars touch everybody, and we can act on a very different way and uh, to help Ukraine in the current war, because it's not just uh, a war, a bilateral reg regional war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a war in Europe, as the title of this panel mentioned. So, and uh, precisely we can act on a very different levels uh, to support, because the Ukrainian side are thinking that the help came too late. 
So I would say this is a difficult discussion to, to uh, questions to answer if it's enough, because perhaps it's not enough, but that's the help and understanding of what was the situation uh, between, um, uh, in Crimea or on the borders between Russia and Ukraine came too late. So that it's um, a short comment I can make. Ian, how much is this due, do you think, the, the February invasion due to the Russian response to Crimea, and how much did that embolden the Russian regime? I mean, I, th I think you have to look back much earlier than Crimea. You have to look back to Transnistria, 1993, when Russia sent in troops, and we criticized them, but we let them do it. You have to look back to Chechnya in 1996, when we criticized them, but we let them do it. You have to look back again to Chechnya, 1999, through the first half of the 2000s, when Russia slaughtered thousands of Chechen civilians, deliberately. That was when they developed the method of war that Tichyana has just described to us, of arbitrarily bombing civilians, grinding cities down, obliterating urban areas. We've all seen the videos from Mariupol, Bakhmut, and other cities. And we said, we said nothing. Well, we said a few things. And then what happened? Well, 9-11 happened, right? So we, we were pally with Putin for a bit. And the great mistake, I think, has been to assume that economic links with Russia will inevitably lead Russia towards a more peaceful approach. It hasn't been true over and over again. Putin has enacted not great violence just against populations abroad, and, and Chechnya, which is in, you know, it's not abroad, but it's not quite of Russia, ethnically Russian at least, but also against populations at home. When we look at the way Putin treats his own civilians, and in the way that he has created a system where Russians are also complicit in treating each other in that way and in normalizing violence and aggression at home. And so, yes, it's, yes, it's Crimea, but this has consistently been the way that Putin has acted, and, and to a certain extent, Yeltsin and his foreign minister in, in Chechnya, who was Primakov, so we have, we have to ask, how do we deal with these things? Do, do we deal with them in, a, in, a, in the way that we would like? Or is it fine words and liberal institutions when we fancy? And economic links when it's convenient, but when it really matters, what do we do? And I would say, to answer the previous question, are we doing enough? The answer is still no. Because already we're starting to talk about what comes next, right? We hope that Putin is deposed, we hope he disappears, and certainly there are voices in the academic and policy-making communities who assume that things will just sort of slowly walk back to normal. But the ideologies we're talking about are much more deep-seated and much more powerful. And I think I might be wrong, right? I might be over-egging my argument a little bit. But we have to assume that I'm right, right? Prepare for the fact that I'm right. And then if it doesn't happen, great. But otherwise, I think we're making another big mistake. What do you think, Tejana, given what Western response there's been, what would have happened in February 2022 had there not been the Western response to the invasion? Well, that's a, yeah, that's a tough question. That's why it happens, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, I mean, definitely, you know, Ukraine was a peaceful country. And uh, when Ukraine got its independence in 1919, 1991, it signed the Budapest Agreement and it actually did demilitarize. Yeah, it gave away a lot of its weapons. So basically, at that time, yeah, just technically speaking, Russia had much more weapons than Ukraine. <laughs> So it's even difficult to pronounce it. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you probably understand what I'm implying. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to pronounce it, but I, I, 
think that without the much Western help and support, the consequences now would have been for Ukraine much, much graver. You feel the, all of Ukraine would have been taken by the Russian forces? Well, I cannot pronounce that. Yeah, I cannot admit that. What, what I'm sure that the Ukrainians would keep fighting in that, yeah, anyway, with whatever with whatever things, yeah, with whatever weapons they have, sometimes just um, barehanded, yeah, which actually did happen when in 2022 Russians was invading Kherson and that uh, that tragedy in the lilac uh, grove when people basically barehanded tried to stop the Russian tanks. Uh, so I do I do think that the resistance would be would be strong anyway. Um, I think I'll open up now to questions and comments from the floor. I have some more questions from uh, people who have sent them in. Um, but if I could ask you to please wait for one of the microphones to reach you. Uh, when it does reach you, please would you um, keep a very concise question, please, uh, and hold the microphone very close uh, to you as you speak. Yes, please, at the right at the back there, please. At the right at the back here, thank you. Uh, please. Bit, bit closer, please. Yes, yes. As you can see, my support for Ukraine is unconditional <laughs> and unambiguous. And you may have already partly have answered my question. Thank you. <coughs> but what can we do to get the Russian and NATO militarists out of the pit they have dug themselves and us into? Let's respond to that. Let's respond to that one. Oh, we'll take it at the same time. I'm moving. Yes, please. Please. Hello. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have heard the presentation, and thank you also for the panelists. My brief question is, uh, I heard from uh, the panelists that in the I quote, every person is a continent, and if a continent dies, a part of us will also die. And my brief question is, what people of the continent, the world at all, or us, should or must do before the world dies? Thank you. Response to those two questions, please. Uh, thank you very much for your comments and for your questions. Uh, I made, as I said, it's very important to understand that the long history of Europe, uh, it's uh, the war, it's not excluded, so it's not a history of pacifism only. So peacemaking, what were the French used to call l'art de la paix, the art of peacemaking, is part of this permanent reality um, uh, between war and the peace. Uh, what I wanted to say, so you mentioned NATO, I can also add to that, for example, the Security Council of the United Nations, for example. So, uh, and uh, the veto power, precisely the veto power. As you know that uh, Russia, the Russian Federation, last month in April had the presidency of the Security Council of, um, of the United Nations. So how we can talk about the role of international organizations, which by definition should define and, uh, and defend peace and try to support a situation of peaceful relations among uh, uh, states. Uh, um, in the world uh, if they are still keeping this presidency. So, and that's precisely one of the main question um, is if you are still can allow the members of the Security Council uh, to take this role, to play this role and to use their veto power when they are, are the aggressors. So, and then can apply in this precise situation of the Russo-Ukrainian war, but also other wars in the past, and for example, uh, led by the United States. So that it's a really, it's a, it's a necessary revision of the role of the international organizations we have today. Uh, 
uh, which kind of uh, um, instruments, international instruments, we have in order to keep a peaceful uh, relations among um, neighboring states, for example. So it's a real questioning around that. So and uh, precisely in the United States, uh, about the United Nations, I was thinking about the role, increasing role, in the last year of the, um, of the General Assembly. For example, they started to overrule some de decisions of the Security Council. And uh, the Security Council of the United Nations is not just the first time it's happening. You can go to back to the League of Nations with they are also the Security Council. So I would say the, the countries, the states who were the guilty one was all of them members of the council, of the boarding council, of the organizations. So that it's a kind of a, um, a default by design of this institution of the United Nations we have today. So that it's a question we can really to think about that. An average of 40 nations abstain when the vote is taken on condemning uh, Russian, Russian invasion on at least three occasions now. Uh, one question here, please, and then there. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think my question is principally for Ian, yeah. I was just interested in your comment there about... A bit, bit uh, closer, please, the microphone. Sorry, a bit, bit closer to you, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, About Chechnya and, and the other places, you could say Nagorno-Karabakh and Georgia and all, all the other stuff that's been going on. 1980s, a part of my job was to go out to Germany and lay anti-tank mines in front of Three Shock Army. Uh, they had quite a lot of tanks in those days, and uh, our job was to stop them. Um, if they decided to come across the inner German border. Now, taking that into account on the fact that we had a principle which we were prepared to stand and die for, what on earth would you expect us to do in Grozny, <laughs> right? You know, you, you said we'd done nothing. What would you expect us to do in Chechnya? To go and fight them? Because at the end of the day, as we're seeing in Ukraine, <coughs> At the end of the day, it all comes down to a fight. And if you're going to have a fight with the Russians, you're going to have a pretty big fight, as we're now finding out. Thank you. And take one here, please. <coughs> uh, one question and one point, point of view, if, if, if I may. I mean, my question is that back in 2014, then we were very, very slow to respond to uh, the, the invasion of, 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 of Crimea. And uh, as you pointed out, 2014 was, was the start of that. And half of the map there, in a sense, uh, in the pink, uh, was part of Ukraine. Uh, no response from the West. So there's a, a question here as to why we're, we're so slow. The second point relates to the peace uh, uh, issue. If, in a sense, we as a country envisage and see and live with armaments as part of our economy, then we have an investment in every war that's happening across, certainly Europe and further afield, by our investment in the arms trade. And in some senses, can we talk or even think about peace when our economy and our day-to-day -day lives and the people who work in the Northeast here uh, are actually making arms with a view to selling them? That in no way is about peacemaking. How do you challenge that, and how do you look at that? Panel, please. So I think on, on the topic of Chechnya, I think you read war wrong, in a sense, in that war doesn't just snap from peace to war. War exists on a spectrum, right? It's very actually quite rare that you get, especially today in the world of hybrid war, grey zone, all this fancy talk, the weaponization of everything one scholar calls it. It's very rare that you get a war that happens where, you know, this is, this is our country, this is your country, anti-tank mines in the middle, the tanks roll across, right? So what could we have done and what could we do today to intervene? We can do a lot more to target Russia today economically than we are. We can do a lot more to target Russian society and disrupt Russian society, and in particular turn, and this is the topic of my book, turn its youth away from militarism than we are doing, so that we don't have to make so many hard decisions about 
you know, very risky topics, as you know. You know, starting, starting a hot war between NATO and Russia is not going to end well. We know that. But the lack of support more broadly in the West has led us to a scenario in which the countries that are on the border with Russia today, like Poland and the Baltic states, are currently rearming fast. Poland is upping its spending, GDP spending, on the military to 5%. And I can tell you that back home in Canada, we're not even going to hit 2%. And Justin Trudeau has said openly, we're not going to do it. That's, that's the NATO standard. So they are creating the barrier, right? They are ready to fight that hot war with or without NATO. And we have to do everything in our power to intervene economically, socially, using the internet, using all these tools available to us to make sure that we don't have to make that decision in the future. And we could have done a better job in the 90s in Chechnya. I'd like also to make a brief comment about the question on uh, Chechnya. Yeah, and um, I'd like to provide an illustration from one of the narratives which was spread in Russia, very popular. In late 1990s, there was a very, very popular film in Russian which was called Brother, tremendously popular. And uh, basically, the protagonist of the story is a young man who returns from the first Chechen war. And he doesn't know what to do. He gets involved into the criminal world. And uh, what he does, he, uh, he has to kill somebody who is uh, portrayed as a bad guy to him. And that bad guy is nicknamed, guess what, Chechen. Whether he is Chechen by nationality or not, it's uh, not quite sure. Yeah, it's, it's not certain. Yeah, but basically the protagonist did kill that bad guy, Chechen, and he proceeds going on to kill other people. There is another bad guy in the story uh, who is called Tata, reference to Crimea. And what is, uh, so basically this is the, the story about that protagonist being, being very good and doing some quite good things. What this film also portrays is very interesting. Some of the home violence, once uh, one of the characters is a woman named Svetlana who at some point helps this wounded protagonist, but she herself suffers terribly from her husband who is an alcoholic and uh, who uh, beats her very heavily, quite regularly. And when at some point she has a choice either to leave her husband and to go with this protagonist, she chooses to stay with her husband. And uh, the whole point is that this film, late 1990s, yeah, I did watch that film uh, at the early uh, 2000, which we did watch a lot of the films, and that was what I saw. I did not notice one of the things. I paid attention to that scene later, after, 2014, when I happened to rewatch the film. And that was the scene when this protagonist was talking to some other people, and they were speaking about taking Crimea back. You see, 1990s, a popular narrative. And you know what is on top of that? I just learned that in 2022, they made a second release of this movie in Russia again. So, I mean, uh, my, my bottom line is that these war narratives, these narratives of violence, they are very, very closely connected. And what I remember about the way how Chechen war was presented, because at that time, you know, Ukraine and Russia had quite close relationships. I do remember that Russia had some problems. The, the countries were criticizing Russia for the war in Chechnya. And then 1911 happened. And I remember overnight, the Russian media switched to portraying the war in Chechnya as their war against terrorism. Before that, they didn't have the right words. They were saying about something about Caucasus, you know, and all that long history. And then overnight, they got it. They got a very nice narrative, which they could sell very easily. And ever on since, it's almost like, you know, in Orwell famous 1984. Overnight, yeah, like everything changes, and you have the history rewritten. I do remember it happened. I was reading some narratives, which were difficult to sell. They were in Chechnya, and then it was easy for Russia. Can I just add to that that Russia consistently co-opts the language of liberal international institutions. It speaks the language of democracy. It speaks the language of human rights. It speaks the language of peace when what it means 
is the language of authoritarianism, a language of violence, right? And we see that time and time again, and that goes some way to addressing the question about the United Nations as well. And interestingly, have you seen the sequel to Brat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who, is, who is the bad guy in the sequel to Brat? Well, our hero, Daniel, as much as one could call him a hero, flies to somewhere in the States, is it New York or Chicago? And he shoots up the Ukrainian mafia. And there is a real sort of gleeful indulgence in the bloodbath. And the film today in the far right community in Russia, you know, the sort of the head banging nationalists, the pro war lot, this is a sort of totemic film. And they quote it frequently in the, when they talk to each other on online. There are lots of memes and sort of bringing this guy back, he's our hero because he went, he shot up the Ukrainians. Question up here, please. First one there, and second one over here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous because I am Russian. Yeah, you, you all were talking about my country. I'm against war. It's, yes, my family against war. We were in a really big depression when the war started. Uh, we left country 20 years ago. We lived in Germany. We lived uh, and have been living here for 18 years. So we monitor the situation really, really closely. So I probably, the person and some of my friends here, Russian friends here, I can spot some familiar faces, uh, can tell from actually people who live in Russia and facing all these problems, what they trapped inside the Russia. So there is a small clarification for your talk today. So you mentioned the military young groups who are volunteering and uh, I know other story of these. So friends, my friends trying to save kids, sending them to other countries with, I don't know, so many flights and, and several days of of travel and failed visa, so they have to run again and again. So I don't know the percentage of Russian people who are supporting Putin or not supporting Putin, but majority, 99% of my friends and family not. And they are not uh, going against the government only because they're facing a really big punishment for 15 years in prison. This, this stops young people to, to do anything because their parents are afraid, they're scared. The parents don't do anything, the kids don't do anything. But believe me, there are, there are some who do and there are facing imprisonment and punishment. So I'm shaky just to think about these things, but there are some uh, some, so the, the Western country, at some extent, provoked this war. They shouldn't be black and white. The, the, even UK, what we can do, for example, do not take money from oligarchs, what you were doing for many, many years, from Ukraine oligarchs, from Russian oligarchs, you were closing the eyes for the source of this money. Half of the London is oligarchs' houses. What, what, what the government done? Nothing. Only when the war started, they start to freeze these accounts. Mm. So this is the first, probably, policy what you have to look at. And then imagine China military going to Ireland and start to build their military base. What would you do? Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, it's quite a big uh, statement, so would you like to respond to anyone more? Please? So, uh, I wanted to, to provide a few elements of, uh, of answer to um, uh, the previous question, which was precisely about how to speak about peace, how we can talk about peace today. Uh, and I would like 
to, I would like to return your question. Uh, for example, you know, does a genuine desire or a pursuit of peace necessarily leads to an absolute rejection of force, of military force? So that it's a question I would like to ask you, because in return, because that it's uh, you know the problem that one fights for the war aims, uh, and those aims are in themselves a certain idea of peace after the war. So by saying that we cannot even talk about peace, so that it uh, doesn't make sense to me. Because you know it's very easily proved that that you know the desire and the pursuit of peace sometimes pass by winning a war and building after. So I would agree with Ian, who is uh, talking about the spectrum of this uh, relation between war and peace. There are degrees, you know, between the situations of peace who are mistakenly described in terms of wars, and situation of wars, uh, state of wars are described in terms of peace. So we need really how you call, for example, Transnistria you mentioned. So you call it a frozen conflict. So on the eastern and southern borders of Europe, you have so many regions, so many what you call the so-called frozen conflicts. What is that? So but potentially that can explode one day, how you are calling again. So it's not only we shouldn't talk about peace, we must talk about peace. Because if not, you are losing the aims of war. You know, what you are fighting, you know, if not, at a certain point to reestablish peace. But reestablish peace it's, uh, and peace and war, it's not just, you know, the, the peace is not just the absence of war. There are different steps. So, and uh, based on European history and the study of European history and uh, the great wars in Europe, there are steps in order to end the war. And the first one, one of the first step, precisely now, it's by winning this war. It's too late to lament it now and to think about what to do, what we should do. So first you win the war. <clears throat> and second, you know, they are not so many solutions, you, it should be a ceasefire at a certain point, and they are either capitulation or uh, an armistice. They are not 100 solutions. And then a peace treaty, they are so several steps you can learn from the European experience about this transition and this difficult relation between uh, a war versus peace. So, but my last moment, my last element here, it's, uh, it's what I call and, um, the amnesia of uh, last wars. Of, uh, we, uh, um, I was looking in the audience, thank you for joining us so many to, tonight, and I was thinking, you know, how many of you remember about the, the blitz and the, the, when the death was coming, was raining from the sky during the World War II, for example? So human beings tend to forget bad experiences. So this never again, as Churchill said, you know, he called the World War II as a tragedy of Europe in his speech at the University of Zurich in Switzerland in 1946, he said, never again. So that was uh, the worst moment in all long European history, World War II. And here we change completely the narrative on the Russian side. You are seeing today that is saying it can repeat. History repeats itself. So that's precisely the uh, again, just to reply to the comments we had about Russia, uh, we, we would not you know, try to generalize that it's not our goal to generalize, but we are free on a free country to expose our own position and, uh, and, uh, and reflections on the current uh, Russo-Ukrainian war. Ian, you seem to be dissenting from the view that Russia may have been provoked into this. So I, I hear what you say, 
And of course, there, there are a great many Russians who hate this war, who hate the idea of the war, who want to see this end, who feel deeply guilty and deeply ashamed about what is happening and what their countrymen and their countrywomen are doing and indeed did do in Chechnya and so on and so forth. And I imagine, let's, let's talk about Ireland. If somebody who is, a, as a British citizen, if Britain were to invade Ireland and murder 9,000 Irish people in cold blood today, I would be deeply ashamed and I would want to imagine nobody in my community and nobody I knew had any part in it and supported it. I understand that desire to want to distance myself from it, that would only be natural. But let's talk about my other country, let's talk about Canada, where Canada is and has been for the last 20 to 30 years attempting to, with, to be honest, pretty limited success, wrestle with its history of killing indigenous people, which was happening until the 1990s, right? And what Russia needs more than anything else in the future is to ask what's gone wrong, not to externalize, not to say we were provoked, not to say this happened because somebody else did something, but no. Who sent tanks into Ukraine last February? Was it NATO? Or was it Russia? And there has to be some soul searching. And I know it's hard, I, I really understand. And in my book, I spoke to a great many people who are wrestling with that problem of finding a language, find a, co a community to talk about their opposition to the war and their opposition to Putin. But we can't just assume that those people are going to win out organically somehow, just because Putin will go and just because the war ends and we find some sort of peace. Thank you, a question over here on the right, please. Yes. British government have got a great deal of credibility at home on their stance on Ukraine, but aren't they in fact being blatantly hypocritical because they, they're sending arms, they're doing training, and they're leaving a sanctions regime with more holes than, than anything else? It, you know, the oligarchs in London are not just the oligarchs, but the legal firms and the accountants and the management consultants are all still coining it on Russian wealth. Thank you, and a question just behind as well, please. Yes, thank you, all three of you, for, for a really fascinating um, panel. I have two questions, you can choose to answer one of them, whichever one you prefer. Uh, the first question is a historical one. Uh, you mentioned the myth of World War II in Russia and how that dominates um, young people's perception of how to relate to the war. Uh, and for all three of you, I think that the shadow of previous wars factored into how you spoke of this war. Could you maybe spell out a bit more clearly how the myths of World War II, I think, primarily are, are factoring into how people's opinions are? I know it's a big question. So I'll ask the other one as well, and that is the question about humanitarianism. Because in Western Europe, I think the knee-jerk reaction when the war broke out was one towards humanitarianism in the general sense of helplessness or the general sense, at least where I, I was in Scandinavia at the time. Um, but I know that the Germans sometimes, when they defend their passivity in this situation will say, but yeah, but we give more humanitarian aid than any other country or many other countries. So could you say something about the relationship between humanitarianism and the issues you have been talking about, which is military assistance and high politics and, and the con like more uh, nationally conceived sanctions, economic sanctions? Thank, thank you. Thank you. A hypocrisy and humanitarianism. Who would like to respond to those questions? <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, maybe I say a few questions about shaping uh, World War II in Russia. You know, for a long time, it was not World War II. It was World War II for the rest world. It was the great patriotic war in Russia. It was the great war of Russia against German Nazis. That, that was, was it. And uh, the 9th of March, yeah, the, the day of the great victory of Russia over the Nazi Germany in the great patriotic war. And uh, that is the fact that there were so many Ukrainians here yeah, who fought uh, uh, in that war. Yeah, very, very, very many Ukrainians died. So probably you won't find a single family in Ukraine who has not been affected by the Second World War. And in terms, we do still remember in Ukraine about the Second World War because the wounds were so deep. And we still remember yeah, about that, for example, my uh, grandfather's elder brother was killed in the Second World War. So all my childhood, I do remember his portrait hanging in my grandfather's uh, um, bedroom. And I remember as growing up, I was thinking that at some point I will be older than him. He died 22. Yeah, so uh, that's um, in terms of uh, narratives. In terms of uh, hypocrisy, yeah, and... Um, Different responses, that's a tough question. Yeah, I do appreciate the other voices. I, I personally don't have any relatives in Russia, uh, but uh, I don't know people who had to stop communicating with their relatives in Russia, because when they were trying to explain that the bombs are falling nearby, uh, their relatives said, but this is for your own good. Just wait a little bit and you will be liberated. And uh, it was very, very difficult for them to get the messages across, which basically, of course, you know, it's, it's very difficult when the family had to split, but I know that, yeah, the families um, had to split uh, there. In terms uh, of the uh, humanitarian aid and feeling helpless, uh, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that what was very special in, in the reaction of Ukrainian people, yeah, and uh, immediately it was not the feeling of helplessness, yeah, it was the feeling of uh, shock, uh, terror, terrible loss, but the help, ordinary people were given to each other, yeah, just we have this numerous stories which can make this perfect uh, films, yeah, or, or novels when the people, they, they did not know each other, but they were extending help of each other, they were sharing whatever they could. And uh, the same thing in uh, many European countries. Yeah, so on the one hand, of course, we have the stories of uh, how Ukrainian refugees find it very difficult, the life in, in Europe, because they had never planned it. Yeah, they, they, they had planned to spend their whole lives in their native country. They do find it difficult. On the other hand, we have so many stories, you know, of resilience, of growing up, of learning the things. And there are, there are these ideas across the communities that are our kids who are in Europe now, across the Ukrainian community, yeah, that our kids who are in Europe now, they will learn a lot and they will be able to come back to Ukraine and uh, to share that experience and uh, to share the experience with the kids who stayed, uh, who stayed in, Ukraine, in Ukraine. So in terms of uh, humanitarian <coughs> aid, yes, that's, that's, that's very, very much helpful. But Again, you know, when just the house is split, yeah, and uh, the dear one is killed, yeah, what, what you really want, first of all, yeah, you, you just want the, the people to be alive. Any other responses? Um, a question here, please. Just the, um, my question's around the cultural impact, really, in terms of do you think it's bed it embedded within the Russian people, um, that mindset, that, 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 that mindset of war? Um, obviously, the lady here has indicated there's a lot of um, Russian people that have a completely different mindset. What do you think our responsibility is to try and change that? And also a question over there, please. Very briefly, in the short to medium term, what is the probability of some kind of regime change in Russia and what is the probability that that regime change would be good from a Western and particularly Ukrainian perspective, given the war? Maybe I can take the first question, um, but not the second. The second. Cause, cause the second question is a horrible <laughs> question. And I'm really worried it's a trick question, and I'm going to look at my phone afterwards. And things will have happened, but you already know. Um, 
so firstly, I think it's really important not to essentialize people and cultures and suggest that Russian people are inherently one thing or another, or that Ukrainians indeed are one thing or another. Right? Culture is constructed. Mindsets are constructed by culture. And I'm interested in really obscure things about language and discourse that I won't go into now, because otherwise everyone will fall asleep. But just as the state and its supporters, of which there are a great many, and I would say the majority, support you know, this, this memory of World War II and sacrifice and Russian Zionism, they have constructed this within the population. It can be deconstructed. And in the closing chapter of the book that I've just released, I talk about what we can do to intervene, right? And what, what we know from, for example, work in Colombia, work in Northern Ireland, work with ISIS, is that we can plot the paths to radicalization. We can plot the paths, what we call identity pathways, towards how people construct their identity. And today, the state, broadly speaking, is trying to create a very narrow definition of what it means to be Russian. That is, to be Russian, to be a good member of society, you have to be Russian. You have to be certainly straight, believe in so-called traditional values. You have to identify with Orthodox Christianity, at least in the distorted form that it exists in Russia today. And if you want to be a good citizen, you have to approve of militarism and you have to approve of violence. Now, in our society, you know, we live in a pluralistic society. You can be a good Briton who is straight or queer, who is any one of uh, who knows how many religions or not religious at all and so on and so forth. Thus, you know, we, we get huge amounts of different identities. We can figure out the exact turning points at which people move to associate different ideas, different identities, and different steps along that pathway with their kind of their end goal of being a good member of society. And we can intervene now on social media. And in my book, I argue that most of the work the state does is through the digital world, is through social media. And the good news for us is that in spite of their best efforts, their ability to restrict Russian, Russians' access to outside information is very limited. Their ability to carry out mass surveillance is very limited, although the Chinese state is trying to help them improve that ability today. It's not often talked about in the media, but it's very significant that that's true. We should be in their social media spaces. We should be showing examples of how you can be Russian, but also queer. How you can be Russian, but a better version of Orthodox Christian, right? We can do this en masse. There's not much they can do to stop us. It will be cheap. It will certainly be a hell of a lot cheaper than buying an F-16 or a HIMARS which you know, run to I don't know how many millions of dollars, and we can do it while we're also winning the war on the ground. Right? This is, it's not easy to do, but it is doable. And I, I don't see much interest from policymakers and governments in intervening in Russia and actually thinking ahead 10, 15, 20 years from now. The focus is on very much on the next arms delivery. I don't know, I, I might be wrong, you might have had different experiences. Uh, I would rather agree with your comments, but I would like to compliment a little. Uh, very recently, I was uh, rereading the papers of the Nuremberg process, so after World War II, and precisely the, um, the declarations of the Soviet um, prosecutor at the time. And I was struck by one of, the, um, um, one of the points of these declarations, because there are many papers about the responsibility of um, Hitler as a leader of the German nation during World War II. And I was trying to remember, to recall now precisely the words, but the words were the following, that the Soviet prosecutor declared at, the, at Nuremberg that there was not just the responsibility of the leader of the German nation on what it happened, it was the responsibility of the German people who elected their leader, who supported him or her, 
and who didn't go against on they could do that. So, so I can't return, so I know I am not clarifying things, but you can look at the things from a different perspective. So is that the responsibility of the, only of Putin, of leader, and what will happen by changing the leader? Or it's also part of the responsibility of the Russian people without desiring to <laughs> generalize, of course. So I'm just putting these questions on the table, because that is a real question. Um, in Russia, you know, you have, after Putin, it's, uh, he kept power already more than 20 years, so, and, uh, and uh, the very general opinion is that uh, it's better to have Putin than to have some one worse. So we have this idea very strong. So the, with the idea that Putin brought a so-called stability to the country after the difficult years of 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union. So that it's a very general opinion of that. So, and, but that it's a question I would like to address to you all, to the audience, because we can ask if our leaders represent us and or they are for some decisions they are making, the governments are all in democratic societies also, they are only the responsibility of the, of the leaders, of the strong men, or also part of our responsibility. So we can look also in this way. Thank you. A question here, please. Hello, uh, my name is Irene and I was born in Ukraine, grew up in Israel and been living in here for more than 20 years. Um, I've got a comment and a question. And uh, my uncle is still in Israel. He lived in 50 years in Ukraine and then moved to Israel, so 20 years in, in Israel. And talking about breaking families, broken families, um, he can barely speak Hebrew, but his basic language is Russian. So what he can hear is the Russian propaganda. So I cannot talk to, this is a person who grew up and was born and grew up in Ukraine. And when his sister, my mom, was, was uh, surrounded and, and, and under the siege in Chernigov, he was just like, no, this is correct. And West has provoked Russia to attack. It's not Russia's fault at all. And you, it's your fault, because England is one of the biggest problematic places that provoked um, Russia. And anyway, so basically talking about broken families, we cannot communicate any, any longer. So the question is probably mostly for, for Mr. Ghana. How much do you think the language, because you say it's so easy to influence Russian and, and, and what they, you know, the, the younger generation, because people choose what they want to believe. Unfortunately, in, from what I can see, because I, I watch YouTube in three languages, Russian, Ukrainian, and, and, and English, and Hebrew occasionally, but uh, from, the, the choices of what they hear and what the freedoms and what they can know is, are quite limited to the language that they kind of, they've got. And, and since, since this invasion particularly, we, we took out all the, all the English schools and everything. So you're saying it's, it's easy, it will be easy to influence. But I'm saying that if we are ever to influence, we, we need to learn Russian. Well, whoever wants to. How, do, how much do you think the language is... Uh, key thing in, in, in this whole propaganda thing. Thank you. Ian. Oh, for sure, I do not think this is going to be easy. This is going to be hugely challenging, right? It's going to be very, very difficult, and it has to be done in Russian. This is one of the points that I make in the book. The world that Putin has constructed, or is attempting to construct for the young today, is one in which Russian, this is this very narrow box, Everything on the outside, the anti-Russian, is equally dangerous. And that's why somebody can be a Nazi homosexual Jew. And that's Zelensky. Which doesn't make sense, right? You can't be those three things together. It's just impossible, right? Everybody would agree with that. And yet, because you're on the outside, it's bad. And consistently, what you find when you look at the, the rhetoric of the people that are on the inside is it is reminiscent of conspiracy theorists. And what people kept telling me as I interviewed them from the book is that 
I understand and know, Ian, it's, it's you that doesn't get it. It's you that doesn't understand. There's just something you haven't got. So we have to create the impression that the message comes from the inside, comes from their friends, comes from their families, and crucially for young people, that it comes from their peers and not from the West. I don't know if anyone saw, but go look up. The CIA released a new video trying to, release, trying to reach out to anti-war Russians today. And you've fallen at the first hurdle because you've put it out from the bloody CIA Twitter account. <laughs> And we hate the CIA. They're terrifying. They're running psyops. They're trying to destroy Russia. They're on the outside. So it has to look like it comes from the inside. Thank you, please. Uh, my question, uh, the Ukraine and Russia are both countries getting weapons. The peaceful country pumping the weapons. Again, Ukraine not expecting to hit in Russia. So more weapon means more bloodshed. It will continue suffering for the Ukrainian people. So my question is, why would be the time to stop the pumping weapon, go on constructive negotiation? Thank you. Please, yes, go ahead. To ask, answer the question, anyone? Um, I, so. Yes, you can come last, yes, yep. Yeah. One, one at the back there as well, please, yes, we're going to end at the front here. Um, penultimate question, right at the back there, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you. This is specifically a question probably for Ms. Stella Gervas, but I'm also curious to hear what the panel thinks. Specifically, how is neutrality going to look forward from here on? Because even fa famously, even Switzerland has denounced Russia for its invasion recently, which, as far as I'm aware, is a huge change in foreign policy for them. So I'm curious to see how is neutrality specifically in Europe changing and how it might look forward. Thank you. So if I may, so first of all, I would like to thank you for the question about the language. It's a very important question, and uh, um, uh, we mentioned, of course, Ukrainian, Russian, but um, Ukraine, today's Ukraine, it's a multicultural country. So to Russian, Ukrainian, we can add Romanian, for example, in the region, and Bukovina, so it's, uh, or Yiddish, which is still spoken in cities as Odessa, uh, on the Black Sea, or in Chernovitz. And um, Ukraine is a much uh, country not unlike Switzerland, for example. We mentioned Israel, so, but Switzerland, which has four languages, uh, three religions, all the br branches of the Christianity are represented, so two main religions, religions are Protestantism and Catholicism. Even in the city of Geneva, which is uh, uh, the city of Calvin, so there was a big tragedy a few years ago when the number of Catholic uh, surpassed 50 percent. So that was a big debate, so in the city of Geneva. So, and um, my question here is that speaking one of these languages of Ukraine, because it's a multicultural, plurilingual country that doesn't define your mother tongue, doesn't define your political allegiance, for example. So, in, and it's for me, it's is wrong because, of course, we can, uh, you know, think what is happening today in Ukraine. So, are changing the names because we said that the names and words matters. And I really couldn't understand this point. Why it's so important to change to uh, change the names of the cities of regions or we have in Ukraine today. And I remember precisely such a debate several years ago, um, uh, just after when Russia invaded um, Crimea in 2014. So there was a similar debate at the Ukrainian Institute in Harvard. And I was discussing with my Ukrainian colleagues, I was saying, look, in Switzerland, we, we solved this problem in 19th century. So all the languages are respected. You can speak your own language. They are not a problem at all. So why should we change the names from Russian to Ukrainians? So, and uh, in, for example, for an English speaking, it should be understandable. England, so Britain used to be an imperial power. 
So English is spoken in Canada, in uh, India, in other many states. So English is still part that the imperial language. So, or for example, France used also to be an imperial power, but French is still spoken, for example, in Switzerland, in Belgium, in Quebec, in Canada, etc. And the Ukrainian colleagues I had, when I had this debate precisely in, in Harvard, they gave me this response. They said, Switzerland doesn't have a neighbor like Russia. So, and that is a precisely by building first a strong, a strong identity, a strong national identity, by uh, um, imposing and by um, encouraging, stimulating people to speak the national language of the country. It's a way to uh, precisely to, to build this, um, um, this position in relation to, in relation to the neighbors, the, um, uh, which was Russia. So that it's a quite so precisely perhaps one of the elements of the response. So that it's a, it shouldn't be, the language shouldn't define you as all of the speakers as Ukrainian citizens, right? And just a final mm. point for the neutrality. Indeed, it's very well because, uh, you know, I am also a Swiss citizen, so that it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, so um, they found it's a big debate in Switzerland, this principle of so-called perpetual neutrality, which was inscribed in the, it's part of the Swiss constitution, right? So it's uh, from 1848, the so-called federal pact of Switzerland, so to respect neutrality, not to intervene. But that's a question of the lawyers, the debates, they found a clause. So in Switzerland, we can, you know, the law, it's an interpretation. So it's a different ways of redefining the status of the country. So that it's a very interesting debate, but we don't have time anymore, I think not. <laughs> we have time for our final question uh, from our last public lecturer on the subject, Rob Dale. Uh, thank you very much to all of the panel. Um, there's so much I'd like to pick on. Thank you very much to the uh, audience for your great questions and engagement. Um, much of our discussion uh, this evening has, about, has been about uh, what more could have been done and what needs to be done in the future. Much of our discussion has been about the problem of Russia and the processes and problems of peace building. Uh, and Martin also talked about uh, the Western response. Uh, my question is slightly different. Uh, could the panel say more about uh, what more can be done to help support displaced Ukrainians, both in the UK and in Europe, the one area I think of the UK response that has been weak as our, has been our support for displaced Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, a lot of our discussion has also been about uh, how we're supplying Ukraine with training or military equipment. Uh, but my, I'd also like to, us to think a little bit more about what lessons we can learn from Ukraine's response uh, and whether there are, th well, what could we learn uh, what lessons can we take from Ukraine's remarkable uh, resilience and fortitude uh, in the last year? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. You know, what, what I know from the, uh, the stories of other Ukrainians who had to leave uh, the country, yeah, for the adults, definitely one of the major issues, they would like to have a job. And uh, quite often, the obstacle for getting that is not knowing the language of the country, because as I told you, yeah, like, a, lot of, a lot of people had, had never planned it. And uh, it helps when English helps, but it doesn't help when English doesn't help, like Hungary, uh, for example. So this is, this is really very tough. And then it's uh, very tough uh, for all the family, it's very tough for the kids when the parents, you know, are in, unsettled in the life and they, they cannot, yeah, uh, keep working. So definitely what everybody wants and what everybody hopes for is a sort of stability because it's very, very difficult to live when you don't know the plans and you don't know what can happen, but that like nobody can provide, yeah? So I know that uh, a lot of Ukrainians do need help uh, 
from the well-trained uh, psychologists, the people who can help them, because a lot of people came through many, many traumatic events, uh, kids seeing their close relatives or their siblings to be short and uh, the houses falling down, or living, you know, uh, in these basements under the shooting, they, yeah, or in this total blackouts, yeah, they, they uh, also get very, very, very uh, traumatized. So overall, I would say that what helps really is to be welcomed as an equal member of community. This is the best for everybody. You know, without this emphasis of being a refugee, but just an equal member, the person who would like to share, you know, the same basic values to care for the family, uh, to build, um, Something, some, some kind of um, something good in this immediate environment to share the kindness further. You know, very, very many Ukrainians who found some shelter in Europe, the first thing they started doing, helping back Ukraine and uh, uh, sending, yeah, if, if they earn uh, the money, sending back. So I would like this really not looking that much upon Ukrainians as victims, but looking as uh, the partners, as the good neighbors, that definitely now would be the best help. I very much wanted uh, Tetiana to have the, the last word this evening. Uh, we've overrun, but I've, I've sensed that there's been uh, a desire to, to hear more and wanted to get as many questions in as, as we could. Um, thank you all very much for coming and for making this such a memorable event. And please would you join me in thanking our panelists.